Coral nutrition is a major concern for us at Tidal Gardens. As a coral farming operation, we try to get both improved growth as well as better coloration out of the corals that we grow here. One very important food source for corals is amino acids. In this video, we're going to try to go over what they are, how corals utilize amino acids, and also try to figure out whether it makes sense to dose them in our tanks. Spoiler alert, I happen to like them a lot. Here's my anecdotal story. A few months ago, I got a bottle of amino acids. I dosed one of our tanks that had a concentration of SPS, like Acropora and Montipora, pretty much on a daily basis. At first, I really didn't notice much of a change, but one day, I was looking at the tank, and sure enough, the corals looked really good. I was noticing nice polyp extension, and the colors were just vivid. Thing is, in a greenhouse system like this, any number of things could be going on. It's hard to pinpoint the exact reason for success or the exact reason for failure. The simple change in seasons could throw things off, so I didn't immediately attribute it to the amino acids that I was dosing. After dosing the entire bottle, I stopped dosing because Let's be real, it was procrastination. Other things come up, and getting more amino acids, it was kind of this relegated afterthought. I probably went a good two to three months without dosing amino acids. In this time, I did notice a slight fall off in coloration and polyp extension, but again, that could be explained by any number of factors, so I didn't really think a lot about it. As luck would have it, another bottle of amino acids fell into my lap. This time though, I noticed the difference right away in the corals. It couldn't have been more than 48 hours. All that polyp extension and vibrancy came right back. I was pretty much sold on the feeding of amino acids at that point. After talking about my experience with other veteran hobbyists, I convinced myself that dosing amino acids is something that I plan to do long term here. That was my personal experience with it, but let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into the topic. So what are amino acids? They are simple organic compounds, and they play a major role in building proteins, as well as other biological functions at the cellular level. There are a little over 20 different types of amino acids, but in most animals, there are only 9 or so that their bodies cannot synthesize and must be taken in by feeding. All of these amino acids have a similar structure to one another. First off, there is a central carbon atom that has, let's call them, four mounting points. On one mounting point, there is a hydrogen atom. On one end of the molecule, they have an amine group, that's NH2, and on the other end of the molecule is a carboxyl group, COOH, which makes the molecule acidic, thus amino acids, right? Lastly, there is a variable side chain that is unique to each amino acid. There are three groupings of amino acids. There's essential amino acids, conditionally essential amino acids, and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are ones that cannot be produced by the body. Conditionally essential amino acids can be synthesized by the body, but may require supplementation from an outside source. Non-essential amino acids can be synthesized by the body from other amino acids, glucose or fatty acids, and do not need any outside supplementation. As we will see later, these groupings vary from species to species. For example, in humans, there are nine essential amino acids. Real quick, those are histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. There are also six conditionally essential amino acids, arginine, cysteine, glutamine, glycine, proline, serine, and tyrosine. And the remaining four non-essential amino acids are alanine, asparagine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and selenocysteine. So getting back onto the topic of coral biology, why are they necessary in corals? Amino acids are needed for protein and tissue growth. 
but they're also what are used to build what's known as an organic matrix. You can think of the organic matrix in stony corals as the physical link between the soft tissue and the skeleton. The matrix provides additional strength as well as allowing for faster calcium carbonate skeletal building. The amino acids most associated with the organic matrix are aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and glycine. Aspartic acid is found in really high quantities compared to all the other amino acids, usually around 35 to 40 percent depending on the coral. In some corals like Gorgonians, it's crazy high. It's like 70% of all their amino acids are aspartic acid. Next up, how do corals get amino acids from the water? It has to be mentioned up front that amino acids have to be constantly taken in because corals cannot store excess amino acids. If there aren't enough amino acids, other tissues have to be cannibalized to fulfill the coral's need for those amino acids. The first way that corals get amino acids is from consuming plankton. So that includes zooplankton, phytoplankton, detritus, bacteria. These are all great sources of protein. When corals feed, they can break down those proteins through the digestive process into their constituent amino acids. The second way that corals get amino acids is by absorbing them directly from the water column. In the ocean, the levels of amino acid that's bioavailable is fairly limited. To acquire the amino acids from the water, corals don't rely on simple diffusion through their skin. They have protein transport mechanisms called carrier proteins. So these proteins are selective for specific amino acids in the water. When they come across the right one, they latch onto it and then activate this gate-like mechanism to transport it inside. Think of that scene in Jurassic Park where they drive that jeep into the gated area and the gate closes behind them before a gate in front of them opens up. It's a similar sort of thing here. These two techniques are not mutually exclusive and may be complementary to one another. What I mean by that is that the coral feeding behavior, such as the polyp opening up, extending feeder tentacles, that may be initiated by the detection of amino acids in the water. That's just a little bit of background information on amino acids, and like I said earlier, they are something that I'd like to keep dosing long term. The problem is, I have a lot of tanks here, and I would need to dose over a gallon a day or something like that when I'm fully up and running in the new building. That can get a little bit expensive over time, so I kind of looked into making my own. Amino acids are pretty cheap. It's just a matter of figuring out which ones to dose. And that is where the real trouble starts. It turns out that the amino acids required for coral nutrition differ greatly from species to species. So real quick, going back to our talk about how amino acids influence feeding behavior. Some corals like Pasilopora are activated by amino acids glycine, alanine, and glutamate. But in another study, specifically about goniopora feeding, their feeding activators were cysteine, glycine, and lysine. There are also examples where certain corals are completely incapable of producing a particular amino acid. Acropora, lack the gene needed to synthesize the essential amino acid histidine. In order for Acropora to get their histidine, they need to rely on the zooxanthellae in their flesh to produce it for them, or acquire it from their diet. It turns out that the coral animal, as well as zooxanthellae, can synthesize amino acids separately, and the two often work off of each other for more than just photosynthesis and the byproducts of photosynthesis. So, as an aside, this reliance on zooxanthellae could explain why certain corals struggle from bleaching events more than other corals. So, for example, here with Acropora, by losing their zooxanthellae, they are also losing a potential source of histidine. Another strange interaction is how light and dark cycles affect amino acid uptake in certain corals. So corals like Stylophora and Zoas 
uptake amino acids more in higher light. This process is called light-enhanced amino acid assimilation. However, corals like Pasilopora take up more amino acids in the dark. Although not corals, there was a study done on Maxima clams that showed that they absorb a total of 16 different amino acids. In high light, there are only 15 that are absorbed, but in periods of darkness, they absorb that 16th amino acid, which is methionine. All of that was a long way of saying it is really difficult to figure out a perfectly tailored blend of amino acids to dose. It may be much easier to just buy them in bulk and then just employ the shotgun approach, and hopefully you cover all your bases. Obviously, that involves quite a lot of loss and waste, and that brings us to the next question. Can you overdo it? Can you overdose on amino acids? The short answer is, I suppose you can overdose on anything in this hobby, and amino acids are no exception there. The effects would be similar to overfeeding any type of food, where you might see a nutrient spike. I don't really worry too much about it because amino acids are so easily consumed and so many organisms can soak them up before pollution issues really arise. Also, our protein skimmers do an amazing job of removing dissolved organic compounds from the water. It's kind of their job, right? They do such a good job that a lot of folks that swear by amino acid dosing turn off their protein skimmers during these feeding sessions just to not extract them too aggressively. Okay guys, that does it for this video on amino acid feeding. I am a big fan of it obviously. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I definitely learned a few new things in making it. Don't forget to leave a like on your way out. And if you like this type of reef aquarium content, I invite you to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to keep up to date on all of our uploads. Until next time guys, happy reefing.